In this final installment of this Let's Read project, I will be commenting on the major themes of the House of the Dead. This book is a tale of an encounter between a man and a world he had never before experienced. As such, it is also about how that encounter challenged and enriched his understanding of the world and the people in it. In these remarks, I will be attempting to trace that development of thought while pointing out relevant points of influence on the author's later work. As I noted once before, many years later, in his Diary of a Writer of the 1870s, Dostoevsky would say that the experience in Siberia marked the beginning of, quote, the regeneration of my convictions, unquote. We have another source from immediately after his release in the mid-1850s, which speaks of one of these convictions with surprising force. This is a letter that he wrote one of his former benefactresses, one Natalia von Vizina, concerning his religious faith. This letter contains one of the most significant passages of any of Dostoevsky's correspondence, and it is worth quoting at length. Quote, I will tell you that I am a child of the century, a child of disbelief and doubt. I am that today, and I know it, will remain so until the grave. How much terrible torture this thirst for faith has cost me and costs me even now, which is all the stronger in my soul, the more arguments I can find against it. And yet God sends me sometimes instants when I am completely calm. At those instants I love and feel loved by others, and it is at these instants that I have shaped for myself a credo, where everything is clear and sacred for me. This credo is very simple. Here it is. To believe that nothing is more beautiful, profound, sympathetic, reasonable, manly, and more perfect than Christ. And I tell myself with a jealous love not only that there is nothing, but that there cannot be anything. Even more, if someone proved to me that Christ is outside the truth, and that in reality the truth were outside of Christ, then I should prefer to remain with Christ rather than with the truth. Unquote. That such a strongly worded pronouncement should emerge so shortly after his release might seem a little out of keeping with the rather measured tone of the House of the Dead. We do not see in its pages any clear and explicit statement of the regeneration of his convictions, or of any grand religious conversion experience. In fact, we might think that the use of a fictitious narrator might serve as a kind of buffer from being too candid in his autobiography. He intimates as much in The Peasant Mare, which is composed some fifteen years after The House of the Dead. Nevertheless, the impact of prison on the thinking of Dostoevsky is not hard to find for anyone who cares to look. We should begin with the kinds of ideas that he swiftly had to abandon. The most striking clash with his prior ideas concerns his earlier naive romanticizing of the plight of the poor. We see this pretty clearly with Poor Folk, his first novel, but perhaps the strongest point of contrast comes when we place House of the Dead back to back with An Honest Thief, the short story of 1848. In that story, we hear of an impoverished drunkard who steals from his friend in order to buy drink, but suffers from pangs of guilt over the deed and confesses in the final scene, just before his death. These notions are blown to bits before we finish Goryanchikov's first chapter in The House of the Dead. The convicts, most of whom are peasants, would constantly steal from each other without the slightest stab of conscience over it. Even Petrov, who develops an attachment to Goryantrikov, steals from him without any remorse. 
And then the constant fighting, the verbal abuse, the prostitution, the drunken outbursts. All of it accosts Goryonchikov's senses within the first few days of his arrival. Perhaps the most striking demonstration of what was facing him in those early chapters is when Gazin bursts through the door in a drunken rage, ready to bludgeon our narrator for no reason, and no one lifts a hand to help him. These are not his brothers, he is forced to conclude. Even if misfortune has landed them all in the same situation, there will be no solidarity there. The only words of solidarity in that scene come from M, and we know that M has nothing but disdain for the peasant convicts. Throughout much of the book, that disdain receives justification. Dostoevsky closes his description of the Christmas holiday with a depressing depiction of the moral agony of his environment, as fighting and drunken carousal breaks out everywhere. He is always running off to the hospital to escape this kind of scene. And while there, he hears the kind of story that would explode the myth of the noble peasant. The story of Akulka's husband, who himself seems to exemplify a depravity intense enough not even to recognize a need for redemption. Anyone who waxes eloquent about humanity in the abstract is destined to be disappointed when confronted with the real thing. So it was with Dostoevsky, and we might consider this to be the primary conflict moving the book, namely whether human beings are worth loving when observed for what they really are. Early on, it may be hard not to take M's view of things. Later, we get the more developed picture. An outgrowth of the younger author's naive views of human nature were his naive political notions. He never was an enthusiastic socialist, and yet his circle of acquaintances were virtually all in that camp. And, as noted in my introductory comments, Dostoevsky himself was deeply involved in a revolutionary plot to overthrow serfdom. That plot rested on the assumption that the peasant population would actually follow the direction of members of the noble class. But as Gazin stood over him with the tray, and no one uttered a word in his defense, the depth of the peasantry's dislike of the gentry became clear to him. We see this feature throughout the book, and obviously it is a source of torment for our narrator, but nowhere is it more apparent than in the episode described in Part 2, Chapter 7. As the complaint against the prison food gains momentum, and our narrator finds himself in the prison yard, Kulikov gently but assertively drives him away, telling him it's no business of his, and jeers from the peasant convicts accompany his departure. Afterwards, Petrov, a man seemingly devoted to Goryanchikov, a man who gently guided his every step during his first trip to the bathhouse, washing him even, the man who was often helping him because he couldn't help feeling sorry for him. That Petrov would be sincerely baffled by the prospect of being Goryanchikov's comrade. Eventually things would change, but for the rest of Dostoevsky's life, he would be convinced that any call to revolt from the literati to the peasant population would be a fool's errand. The worlds of the peasant and of the nobility were simply too far apart. But even if some socialist society could be effected in Russia, the result would not be desirable. Several themes emerge in the book that demonstrate the author's ideological departure from the leading principles of his former companions. Consider first what he describes as one of the greatest tortures of the camp, the complete lack of privacy, compulsory life in common. Right in the first chapter, as our narrator describes the greatest challenges he faced, this feature takes priority of place. Yet life in common is the dominant feature of the phalanstery of Charles Fourier and other prominent socialists of the 1840s. 
Consider also his strong words on the importance of personal property. All the convicts have some sort of trade, and without work and normal lawful property man cannot live, he tells us. Man goes crazy otherwise. Elsewhere he tells us that money is coined liberty, and it is this that the convicts craves more than anything. Working towards its acquisition with his own trade is his release valve on the psychic pressures he endures every day. Connected with these comments are his words on the importance of free labor and its contrast with forced labor. The forced labor of the camp, he says, was hard precisely because it was forced. Even if in other respects it was easier work than the peasant might have faced in his own fields. A related object lesson on this score comes from Part 1, Chapter 6, where the convicts only find happiness in their work when they are set a task, that is, given a particular task to accomplish, after which they can return to their own barracks. They gain only half an hour by their labors, but because it is their time that they earn, they invest themselves in their work. The values of privacy? free industry and private property, these simply cannot be the priorities of a socialist. House of the Dead is not really an ideological work, and yet it seems clear that he has left his socialism firmly behind. If his first impressions involve horror at the disgusting behavior of his fellow convicts, by the final chapter, Goryanchikov is saying something rather different. Quote, after all, one must tell the whole truth. These men were exceptional men. Perhaps they were the most gifted, the strongest of our people. Unquote. How do we move from disgust to such high praise? Who are these people really? One of the most vivid pictures we get of this crowd of convicts is the famous bathhouse scene. There we see this seething mass of humanity stacked on top of each other, sloughing off filth, battered, the scars of past floggings marring the flesh, sometimes jockeying for a position, stepping over each other, entangled in each other's chains, and overall mad Isai Fomich singing triumphantly at the top of his lungs. It really does seem like a scene out of Dante, but more, it gives the feeling of a crowd of human beings writhing in some communal, hapless mass, all having been caught up in a swirl of forces much greater than themselves. At the end of Part 1, I listed off a roster of convicts, matching each one with his crime. For many of those prisoners, it really did seem like they were simply swept up in other forces— and the common title applied to them by the townspeople of Omsk, that is, the unfortunates, really does seem like the apt description. Prisoners like Sirotkin or Sushilov or Ale really were simply unfortunate. There were, on the flip side, some truly wicked villains in their midst, but many had some peculiar or interesting backstory which presents the convict in revolt against some real or perceived oppressor. In Part 1, Dostoevsky presents us with three such cases in successive chapters. One of them is Baklushin, who murders a rich but odiously disdainful German out of romantic jealousy. Another is Luka Kuzmich. We don't get to see Luchka's initial crime, but the context suggests that he murdered some overbearing authority figure, and then became addicted to the role in a sort of delirium. By the time he is in Siberia, he is bragging about having laid out a despotic supervisor of a former prison, desperate to be perceived as an extremely dangerous man. And then there is Petrov. He has no desire to be perceived as dangerous. He is dangerous, arguably the most dangerous man in the camp. But he is not malevolent. Far from it, in fact, as evidenced by his care for Goryanchikov. Uh, 
He is simply a man without inhibitions. What he chooses to do, he will do, inexorably and without fear. When he decides that it is time to kill his commanding officer, that is what he does. When he decides that it is time to kill Major Eight Eyes, that is precisely what he sets out to do, until Chance rescues the Major before the plan can be executed. When in the final chapter Dostoevsky calls the convicts exceptional men, he is not to my mind at that point giving a moral description. He is describing their strength of will. When other peasants bent under the weight of their oppressors, they did not. That is why many of them are there. Considered as a mass, one of the defining features of the convicts is their care for their own dignity. That seems to be the root of much of the fighting and bickering that dominates life in the camp, and it explains their disdain for those who don't follow suit, either because of submissiveness, as we get with Sushilov, or because of buffoonery, as we observe with Skuratov. And it also explains why they have more respect for officers who know their own worth. While their life on top of each other day after day leads to all kinds of bickering and depravity, Dostoevsky often describes them as being like children. They will eagerly compete over who has the most knowledge of generals, or debate which officer would give the other a beating, or gush over the genius of the two escapees, or what have you. But the clearest instance of this kind is the theatricals, which they take on with such naive enthusiasm, both in their preparations and in their eager consumption of the product. And the theatricals are revealing in at least two other ways as well. They astonished Dostoevsky with a wealth of talent that had simply been entirely unnoticed by the cultural elites of Petersburg or Moscow. And they afforded a rare moment where the peasant convicts would show special consideration to a gentleman, seeing in him a connoisseur of the arts, and thus giving him a preferred seat. This, too, struck Dostoevsky. Despite the grudge that the peasants bore against the upper class, it wasn't a mindless hatred, and they were happy to show respect where they recognized it was due. And these moments of moral brilliance come through here and there throughout the book, and not only with especially kind or good individuals, but with the convicts as a whole. The convicts are always fighting and stealing from one another, but when they receive alms from the local townspeople, they are very deliberate about sharing what they receive equally. The fact that the poor townspeople of Omsk are so naturally inclined to give alms to the prisoners is itself notable. And for all their coarse and disgusting behavior, you can see a deep reverence in them when it comes to the holy services at Christmas and Easter. The description of the Easter service in Part 2, Chapter 5 is particularly striking, as we see the convicts in chains at the back of the church, bowing down to the ground when the priest says, Accept me, O Lord, even as the thief. These glimpses give some credence to Dostoevsky's occasional hints that the penal system can actually make people much worse than they were to begin with. Among the convicts is a lot of very good raw material, and much of their aberrant behavior may well be the effect of the very justice system in which they are trapped. Naturally, when our author takes to criticizing the authorities, he always has a guarded tone, emphasizing that he is really describing the situation under the prior reign of the deceased Nicholas I, even at one point describing the time of his imprisonment with the phrase, in the recent but so remote past, that is, remote from the new and enlightened reign of the then current Alexander II. It is hard to find officers like Major Eight Eyes today, he assures us, or anyone who would use such tyrannical slogans as I am your god, your czar too. Perhaps some of his concerns about corporal punishment had also ceased to be pertinent by 1862. Perhaps. Perhaps.
But some of his criticisms seem to stretch to his present day, and some may even present timeless problems that admit of no solution. The senseless policies in the hospital regulating the use of the privy apparently were in place at the time of writing, for instance, as well as the regulations forbidding property and personal trade. The latter are vexing in another sense as well, as they are among the many ways in which the authorities seem to distort the incentives for those under them, as chronicled throughout the book. The convicts are much better behaved when their energies are directed toward a trade. By prohibiting private property, the authorities undercut their own interests. We see in Sorotkin's story and elsewhere that military life was so onerous that some might commit crimes precisely in order to get into prison. And floggings were so terrifying that convicts would commit crimes to change their luck, delaying the moment of the flogging, even though the sentence would be increased after the trial. All of these are ways in which punitive policy seemed almost to encourage rather than discourage bad behavior. But one of the problems of the criminal system as diagnosed by Dostoevsky may defy any solution. That is the problem of matching the punishment with the crime. The problem is twofold. On the one hand, the book chronicles in just how many different ways a particular crime, such as murder, may be committed. Some are done out of pure villainy, others out of desperation. How can the penal law be sensitive to the varying degrees of blameworthiness for the same kind of act? On the other hand, different people are affected differently by the same punishment. Just as slapping a baby is much worse than slapping a horse, so too is hard labor for the gentleman worse than hard labor for the peasant. Both ends of this issue come up time and time again in the book. But no matter how badly the justice system may be arranged, regardless of how distorted the incentives may be and how complicit the authorities are in the moral degradation of these prisoners, at no point is Dostoevsky willing to absolve the prisoners of moral responsibility. In fact, at one point he argues explicitly in the opposite direction. This would go against the grain of what some of his peers were saying in the late 1850s and early 1860s, most notably Nikolai Chernyshevsky. Chernyshevsky and his allies would argue that humans were merely the product of their environment, and that all human behavior could be explained according to the motive of self-interest, the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. Appropriate policy in governing both societies and individual lives is to leverage this simple feature wisely, and so morality is a matter of rational egoism. In the following year, Chernyshevsky would develop these ideas in a very influential novel entitled What is to be Done, which became a favorite of Vladimir Lenin half a century later. But this perspective, Dostoevsky is arguing, is simply not true to the facts of human nature. The egoistic principle is unable to explain the acts of kindness that pepper the pages of the book, as he at one point states explicitly. And the idea that we could somehow harness mankind's impulses in a rational way so as predictably to generate some socially approved result is just blind to the forces lurking in the depths of the human soul. Time and again we see these people breaking out in unexpected and seemingly irrational actions which would confound any utopian's goals of systematizing human behavior. What are these forces? One, as noted already, is fear. Often, terrified of the lash, the convicts will do anything to postpone it, even if they know in advance that the net result will be a stiffer sentence. Another is the thirst for dignity and justice. The unwritten rules of social interaction in the camp revolve around this principle, but sometimes it explodes in ways that are unpredictable. 
The prison authorities are sometimes surprised, he writes, that after leading a quiet, exemplary life for some years, a convict with no apparent reason suddenly breaks out into a spree of misbehavior or even serious crime. Why? His answer, quote, The poignant hysterical craving for self-expression, the unconscious yearning for himself, the desire to assert himself, to assert his crushed personality, unquote. Similarly, something about the need for dignity is at the root of Dostoevsky's claim concerning what he imagines to be the worst of all conceivable punishments. Forcing someone to do something utterly useless, such as moving a pile of dirt from one location to another and back again. This, he says, would destroy a man utterly. And why? In his words, because of its, quote, senselessness, humiliation, and shame, unquote. A man needs a sense of dignity. And so the convict also thirsts after freedom, some indication of his own power. So he will do any sort of irrational thing to get a sense of it, even if the thing he gets is a mirage. The best example here is the description of the vodka binge. Nothing good comes of it. A man scrimps and saves day after day with hard labor, and then blows it all on a single day of drinking, with nothing but a headache and more poverty to look forward to in the morning. And he knows all this ahead of time. Why all this useless waste? Dostoevsky tells us, the man simply wants the illusion of freedom, the feeling as of having power over his life, if only for a moment. And then there are his comments on hope. The prisoner is a dreamer, he says, irrationally talking about his future life outside of prison, as though he will be in the prime of life upon his release. Some of these speakers have sentences that stretch for decades yet, and will probably never survive to see the end of them. He has a surreal description of prisoners chained to the wall at Tobolsk, who hang on day after day, waiting in anticipation for the opportunity merely to walk in the prison yard. And in the latter stages of the book, as he is classifying the prisoners into various categories, he reserves one special category for prisoners who had lost all hope. When a person has lost all hope, he becomes a monster in his misery. Without some goal and some effort to reach it, he tells us, no man can live. So, the model according to which human beings merely seek after pleasure and avoid pain is hopelessly naive. What we really crave, what we hope for, is freedom and dignity. This leads us back to the issue with which we began. In what way can we say that Dostoevsky's experience led to the renewal of his convictions? And what explains his remarkable statement, penned so swiftly after his release, that if Christ and truth do not coincide, he would choose Christ over the truth? The House of the Dead does not contain anything quite like a description of a conversion experience. The closest we get to a moment like that comes from The Peasant Mare, which was written much later. But in the volume of 1862, we do get a sense of the gradual discovery of the goodness of the people around him and the depth of humanity that lies beneath the revolting, coarse exterior of these convicts. The author of the 1840s encouraged his readers to develop a love and sympathy for the poorer classes. The author of the 1860s recognized all the defects of these people, but loved them for the moral wealth beneath. The younger Dostoevsky considered the poor to be hapless victims of forces beyond their control. The mature Dostoevsky recognized the cruel extent to which those forces could turn a man into a morally withered mummy, but also firmly believed in the moral responsibility of individuals. The younger author believed in God, 
but appeared to associate the work of God with social reform. The older one believed in God, but took the domain of faith to lie in deep places of the human psyche beyond the reach of social policy. These are his regenerated convictions, and they take much stronger form since they were forged through suffering. The peasant Mare tells of this renewal as though it were a sudden epiphany. He could, like the Polish prisoner M, look upon all these prisoners as so much human excrement. But the memory of the saintly Mare flooded his mind, and he realized that the people he was encountering may well be Mares at rock bottom. All the occurrent empirical evidence of the moment testified to the loathsomeness of these people. But Dostoevsky was given the ability to do a sort of gestalt shift of the mind when he looked at them, to see the face of Mare, or perhaps the face of Christ, in the faces of these fallen men. When he writes his famous Credo in 1855 that he would rather remain with Christ than the truth if the two should part ways, I believe he is choosing to engage in a similar sort of gestalt shift when observing the world as a whole. Perhaps all the occurrent empirical evidence testifies to the utter indifference of a deeply flawed, occasionally loathsome universe. But Dostoevsky nevertheless chooses to see something more when he looks at it. And perhaps it is the deep waters of human nature itself that lead him back to Christ. How that would unfold over the next two decades would present the world with some of its most compelling literature. Finally, it would be good to explore a few of the many ways in which the episodes described here have their echoes in later writings. Thematically, we might say with Joseph Frank that the matrix of the entire mature Dostoevsky is contained in these pages, but it would be good to note a few of the more particular harbingers of things to come. A number of these influences can be observed in minor details, and even as early as his Siberian novellas of 1859. In his treatment of peasants in the village of Stepanchikovo, for instance, we see the Kamarinsky, we hear characteristic scraps of peasant dialogue, we observe the author lampooning the idea of turning peasants into gentlemen, we hear the threat of conscripting a peasant into the military, and so on. In Uncle's Dream, we see a character who commits suicide by drinking vodka laced with snuff, which is an echo of Ustyantsev's action in the prison camp. By 1861, Dostoevsky feels confident enough to write of the criminal underworld, and his Insulted and Injured includes a character who drinks away his father's inheritance, like more than one figure we observe in House of the Dead. And the list goes on. Naturally, his years in prison acquainted Dostoevsky with many different varieties of, and motives for, murder. All of his great full-length novels contain murder. At least one of the initial readers of Crime and Punishment found the description so vivid that he couldn't help but wonder if Dostoevsky had once killed someone himself. As noted in earlier comments, the accused parricide served as an inspiration for one of the Karamazov brothers. Another of his characters finds an origin in the prisoner A. Svidrigailov is one of the most detestable figures in Crime and Punishment, and when we look into Dostoevsky's notes for the novel, the character is labeled Aristov, that is, our prisoner A. Those familiar with the novel will see the comparison. Of special thematic importance is the narrator's encounter with the bandit Orlov. Orlov, you will remember, was the notorious criminal who had murdered countless innocents in his various raids, and stayed briefly in the prison hospital in between sessions before the lash. He was in one sense heroic, mostly indifferent to his floggings as a mere inconvenience separating himself from his attempt at escape. In the brief conversation between Goryanchikov and Orlov, 
our narrator attempts to probe at the man's conscience, to discover whether he could find any lingering sense of remorse. The response he provoked was simply derisive laughter, and Orlov looked at him as an innocent little boy. Joseph Frank suggests that Orlov may be forerunner of the kinds of ideas that motivate Raskolnikov in crime and punishment, where certain people may be thought to be elevated above the simple, slavish morality of the masses. Certainly Nietzsche was himself an avid consumer of the House of the Dead, and it is not hard to imagine him considering the indomitable will of Orlov when developing his idea of the Ubermensch. And last, we should take note of the story Akulka's Husband. The two villains of the story have little in the way of redeeming quality, although we do discover that sexual jealousy is at the root of their behavior. The more fascinating figure is Akulka herself. She utters only a few words in the story, but they are poignant. She suffers horribly, from her own parents, from Filka Morozov, and then from Shishkov, the story's narrator. She is beaten routinely, both before and after the ill-advised marriage. She is slandered and yet virtuous, beaten and yet faithful. And after all this, most all of which was originally caused by Filka Morozov, when Filka makes his confession on the day of his departure, her only words are to forgive him, and then to say that she now loves him more than all the world. Akulka may just be the purest instance of an idea that runs through much of Dostoevsky's work, the theme of the meek one, and indeed there is a short story with precisely that title in his corpus. Often we see this with his female characters, women pure of heart who meekly endure suffering at the hands of others. Sonia from Crime and Punishment comes to mind. When it comes to the purity of the image, I think Akulka may be rivaled only by the vision of the suffering horse in Raskolnikov's fever dream. And perhaps here we get an iteration of the infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing that we read about in T.S. Eliot's poem. And there is more to mine from The House of the Dead, but these remarks have gone on more than long enough already. I expect I will be taking a little bit of a break before tackling another project on this channel, but my next port of call will likely be a lesser-known short story entitled An Unpleasant Predicament, which is sometimes translated as A Nasty Anecdote. This was another of Dostoevsky's works from the year 1862. But our current Let's Read is at an end. Per usual, if you find these comments to be inaccurate or incomplete, please feel free to improve upon them in the comments section below. I thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the experience.